Good afternoon, Diane. Good afternoon to you as well. Edizione Ambiente has just published your Economics of Enough in uh, Italian, in Economia dell'Abbastanza. Um, I would like you to tell us why did you write this book? The immediate cause, as I explained at the beginning of the book, was the financial crisis. When I found myself looking at the newspaper stories, reporting that the banks didn't trust each other enough to lend money between themselves overnight. And I thought, if they don't trust each other, I don't trust them with my money either, so I better get my money out of the bank. And I got a lot of cash out because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to go to the supermarket and use my credit card to buy groceries for the family and so on. And it was obvious that this was an extraordinary catastrophe mm -hmm. for the Western economies. How had the financial sector brought us to this point when we might not be able to buy food in the shops? But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought this was actually only one aspect of the kind of crises that we have been facing recently. And that the broader issue is sustainability, that we have an economy that in many dimensions is not sustainable. And there's a choice to be made because things that are not sustainable are not get sustained. And either they end in catastrophe like the financial sector has, or we can try to look at the tensions and do something about them. And so perhaps we can... Have... Sorry if I bulge in, but um, I understand that your concept of sustainability is a little wider than the one we are accustomed to. Um, in this case... In most cases, we intend sustainability as being an environmental uh, aspect, while here you're taking into account the environment and many other things, I understand. Yes, and that's ab absolutely a, a very important use of the word. But it's, it illustrates actually the, the wider point. We talk about environmental unsustainability because in our use of natural resources and what we're doing to the atmosphere, we obviously cannot continue doing what we have been doing. But I think that's also true of the financial sector, of government finances, and of the way our societies are becoming more unequal and more unstable. We have an economy um, that has lots of complicated links between people and between companies, and the importance of trust in that economy is very high. But when you have such kind of inequality and social tension, how can you maintain the trust that's needed? So sustainability, although we use it mainly about environmental issues, I think does have a much broader meaning. Can we carry on as we have been doing? And I think the answer is, is no, we can't. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, this is very clear indeed. Um, could you tell us what are going to be the main issues we're going to be dealing with from now onwards? I was looking at the main issues where we are eating the capital that should be left for future generations, where the legacy that we are leaving our children and grandchildren is worse than the one that we inherited ourselves. And the environmental situation is one of those. We simply don't know what's going to happen to the global climate because of, of what we've been doing. We don't know how we will make up for some resources that we are depleting and not replacing. The um, financial crisis of sustainability is another important one. And actually there I'm thinking not so much about the banking crisis, although that's obviously a very great financial burden for taxpayers, but the fact that we have pension systems, healthcare systems, social security systems that have been built for a time when there were more and more young people to support the, the older population. Now it's the other way around. Actually the demographic situation in Italy is quite severe and there'll be fewer young people to support a growing population of older people and we haven't adjusted either the patterns of work or the tax systems to make that sustainable at the moment we're expecting our children to pay for all of that well it does sound that really what needs to be overhauled is the entire economy and not just the financial system well i think it does and if you set out all the problems you could actually get quite depressed about it because they all look like pretty important and difficult challenges and and there are lots of them to address yes, indeed that's what you're telling us we could get depressed but in fact you point out the fact that there is room for action and that's where you are leading us to yes 
action in several ways. One I talk about in the book is measurement, because we have always put a lot of emphasis on the flow of income in the economy. GDP is, is a flow of how much is made and uh, what incomes are year by year. And actually, I think it's a very important measure because it captures the kind of innovations that make our day-to-day -day life so much better, the uh, innovations in health and the standard of living that we have now. So I'm actually an advocate of using GDP, but we need a measure of the nation's capital, the economy's capital as well, a kind of balance sheet so that we know how much of the assets we are using up in creating this year's income or next year's income. So measurement is one thing. I think that's, although it seems a bit dull, statistics, it's actually very important because you can't affect the political debate or make people think differently about the choices to be made if you're not showing them what the effect of, today, of today's choices are. So it's, it's actually really important. But then also in institutions and using the new technology and people taking responsibility for organizing the economy differently themselves. And I'm actually really encouraged by the amount of institutional innovation that we see going on in society as people use the new technologies to connect. I suppose the, uh, the best example since I wrote the book is, is the use of um, uh, social networks and Twitter for organizing politically in, in the Arab Spring and in other manifestations like the Occupy movement. And whatever you think of them, actually it's a really creative way to bring people together using technologies and addressing and discussing some of the problems that we're facing. So next week you're going to be in Italy for the Trento Economics Festival. So may I ask you, what do you expect from such an event? And what do you anticipate might come out of it? Well, I'm going to be very interested to um, learn what people in Italy think about uh, what the Italian government is doing. For me, it's interesting because it's a government run by an economist who is being asked to take some very difficult measures that elected politicians find very hard to put to the voters. So anything like pension reform or changing working practices is obviously extremely difficult for anybody to do politically. And so... I want to find out if trying to have a technocrat, an economist, introduce those actually does make it any easier or actually any harder to implement them. And, and these measures that economists call structural reforms, I mean, it's, it's a code word really for reforms that are very difficult politically because you're taking away from some groups of people to benefit other groups of people, and that's, that's never easy. So I'm interested to see how that's going. Um, I think... It's obvious to me that Italy does need changed working practices, uh, a higher participation rate by women, for example, people staying in work longer, a different kind of structure of pension payments. If, um, if the, uh, the system of pensions is to be afforded in the future with a very, very much smaller number of people of working age. So, um, so that's interesting. Obviously, the debate about austerity is particularly acute in Italy compared to the UK because of the urgency of the government's finances. And um, so what's interesting about that is that often we talk about sustainability or enough as um, being less consumerist, being less materialist, making do with less, spending less, saving more. And we have a very different tone of voice talking about that from talking about austerity measures introduced by the government. But actually, they're the same thing. Yeah, at the end of the day, yes. Yeah. And this brings me to a very interesting point you make in your book, and that is um, the importance of trust. The fact that people and institutions and the economy is completely based on the mutual uh, trust. My question is, how do you think a government of economists, a government of technocrats, is in a position to ensure that trust develops and maintains itself. In fact, do you sincerely believe that such a government can actually give the sense of perspective which is needed to infuse people with the sense of where they're going to be going? Well, I think everybody knows that appealing to reason and calm doesn't get you very far in some of these political debates. 
So can you get a, a reasonable economist to say, look at these figures and let's all do the sensible thing when we look at the figures, that's not going to work. Um, an example I like a lot is one they use in Australia in a publication called Measuring Australia's Progress. And it's a sort of annual national balance sheet of the kind I was describing a little while ago. But the interesting thing about it to me is that they asked people what should go in it. So it wasn't that the economists and the statisticians decided these 25 measurements are important for us to figure out how well we're doing running the economy. Right, so they you're asked, saying the method was just as important as... Uh, as yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's... Okay. So, so the legitimacy comes not from voting, but from the process of consulting people. Yeah, and participation. That's participation. All, yes. anyway. Well, I don't know. I think there are examples of people using the new technologies to, um, they, of course, they won't reach everybody. They won't reach the many millions of people who vote in elections. But actually, you can reach a, a very high proportion of people who care about it that way. And I've myself run public consultations where 18, 20, 25,000 people do reply. And you're relying on a few people to dig into the statistics and explain it. And they'll talk on blog posts and Twitter. So you have people mediating it for a great majority. But that's just like newspapers expressing right. what politicians say. It's a different mechanism, but the same kind of process. Well, thank you very much, Diane. This does indeed give us the full perspective of your book, and it gives us a taste of what you're going to be bringing us and bringing uh, our readers and what we will be expecting to hear from you at the uh, Festival of Economics in Trento, which is going to be your presentation, is going to be held on the 2nd of June 2012. Thank you very much again. Thank you. I will see you again soon. A prestissimo. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye.